Okay, so in our last video, we shaped our input matrix X to try to predict our target variables Y. Uh, so in this video, I'm just going to talk about running the, the convolutional neural network, okay? Uh, I think I'm going to break those up into two, two separate videos, but uh, first we need to kind of pick up where we left off and just write in some, finish off the rest of the code. Um, to start to run the network and then we'll go up and define our convolutional model um, in a function somewhere. So at this point, uh, to give you an example, I actually ran this for time. So our x dimensions look like number of samples, uh, and then we have a time dimension, and then we have our 13 features, our MFCCs here. And we don't have that one on the end. If this was convolution, 13 would be here, 9 would be here, and then you'd have a 1. Uh, and I also, let's take a look at what Y looks like. So if you remember, when I was talking about the, the categorical cross-entropy uh, and how we need to hot encode our variables, this is what this means. We need to like, hot encode them, but they need to be put in an actual matrix. Um, and this is just so Keras is going to know what to do with them. Uh, it's kind of a weird thing, but that, that's the idea behind categorical cross-entropy you have these hot encoded target variables. All right, so um, the first thing we need to do is we need to take that, that hot encoded Y matrix and then we need to map them back into their original um, class encoding. So I think, yeah, these index. So the indices that go along with these actual labels that we have here. And I'll show you why we need to do this. Typically, you don't need to, but because we're going to be dealing with class imbalance, um, we're going to need to do this. So the way you can easily go back to those labels is we're going to do what's called NumPy arg max. So it will return the the index value for each of the. Let me just explain it. Um, if I pull up y, arg max is going to go through this first thing and it's going to say I have a one here I'm going to return two so we're just going to map back to the original columns that these ones match up with okay uh, and what we're going to do is that's going to create a, a flat um, n samples by one array and then we need to define our input shape so our input shape for the convolution is going to be x dot shape one by x dot shape two by one. Um, so whenever you have to give the input shape to uh, the first layer of your your neural network in Keras, we we have to give it input shape, but we don't really count the n samples. So we don't worry about this twenty six thousand number. And we just need those, remember? And now uh, let's also call our model. So we're going to create a function later. Uh, it's going to be called git conv model, so convolutional model. And that'll set us up for the convolution. Now we're going to be doing uh, really the exact same thing. So we can just copy and paste a lot of this. So for the recurrent neural network, uh, same thing, but now our input shape is we're just going to get rid of this one. And then we're going to create another function later. It's going to be called get recurrent model. That looks good. Uh, so now let's do class weight. Uh, so class weight is equal to like the way the way we're going to do this is if you look at the imports up here, we imported from scikit-learn utilities uh, compute class weight. And so what this will let us do is kind of in the same way that we created this probability distribution, like from here, uh, we're going to be doing something kind of similar, but uh, compute class weights will actually give us uh, some weights that we can. So when we update the weights within our neural network, it'll basically take a look at the, the probability distribution and be like, well, uh, so for example, like I have, I don't have a lot of base drum, so uh, when I make this weight matrix update, I'm going to step a little bit further in the direction for my gradient descent because I want to make sure that I actually 
compensate enough to learn the bass drum features, if that makes sense. Uh, hopefully you guys have a, a good understanding of neural network theory of how that works. But uh, so the class weight, the way this works is we'll, we give it this kind of parameter called balanced. And realistically, this might only help your accuracy or loss function by like a little bit. It's not much, but if you want to get that, you know, a couple extra percent, this is a good way to do it. So, and reduce the bias in your network. So this is why we have to create that 1D um, Y matrix. We have to do the NumPy unique on it. Although thinking about it, we probably already had it up here. Oh, well. Um, and so then we just give it the actual, so we get the, the class mappings of Y flat and the actual Y flat matrix. Unfortunately, when I run this now, it's going to take a long time to run. So uh, now we have to create model.fit. So this is super easy. Model.fit is basically just going to take this big X and Y matrices and it's going to randomly create batches of our data. Um, so our epochs, I'm going to set the epochs to, to 10. It's a pretty good number. Why not? And the default batch size is 32, and that's what I'll be setting it to. I'm going to turn shuffle to true, even though technically it's already shuffled. Uh, and then class weight. Uh, class weight. So when you call fit, normally you don't, you don't have to call class weight, but because we adjust, we want to handle class imbalance and try to like make sure that our network doesn't create some biases based on just like the distribution of data size. We're going to feed it this uh, class weight that we calculated with the scikit-learn uh, method that it provided us. So it's kind of a interesting bit of knowledge. Uh, so now let's go and build a function to create our convolutional model. And this is going to be the bigger of the two models, I believe. Maybe not bigger, but like in terms of lines of code, it's a little bit more because it's convolution. So we'll do get conf model. And um, we're going to be using the sequential model just because these are super simple. So we don't need to use the functional API. If you weren't familiar, Keras has a sequential API and like, I don't know why I call it API. It's, it's a sequential model or like this modular model um, where sequential makes uh, like this assumption that you can just do model.add and you can keep adding layers and they're just, they're stacked up one after the other. Whereas if you want to do some more complicated stuff, you can do like the functional API where you actually have to tell which layers uh, connect to certain ones. So when it comes to the convolutional model, um, typically, you know, you, you might have a convolutional layer followed by a pooling layer and you would kind of stack those up over time and you'd eventually pull down your data. Like if your input space is really high, then having a lot of pooling makes sense. But because our, like the size of, we're only using a 10th of a second, okay? Uh, so the, the convolutions, the matrix is only a 13 by nine by one. Okay, and so we really wanna, we only wanna pull down once. And the idea behind that is that we don't wanna keep destroying our, our data space. We just wanna keep building out more and more filters using convolution so we can learn more and more like different features about how to classify uh, kind of like the contours in the MEL frequency septal coefficients. And then at the, the end, we want to pull it down and then just flatten it out into some dense layers or like some fully connected layers, okay? Um, so the idea here is we'll start very general. We'll use uh, 16 filters and they're gonna be built with a three by three convolution. And then our activation, I'm just going to use ReLU for all these activations. ReLU is kind of like the go-to for most of this stuff, although some people like some other other activation functions. Uh, so the stride, because our input space is so small, we can get away with using a one by one stride here. Um, and the idea is like if 
if you have a, a huge input space, you want to make your stride like a two by two, and you might consider making this first uh, kernel convolution like a five by five. Um, that way, like your number of parameters that you're trying to solve for, it keeps the, the number of values down. And we're going to make padding the same. So um, padding can be like valid or same. Valid will start to chunk off like it won't preserve the dimensions of your, your input matrix. Okay. So that's why we need to do that. Um, and you also might want to put like batch normalization between these, but I didn't. I, it might matter, it might not. And because this is our first layer in the model, we need to uh, declare the input shape for, for the first layer. So now let's add another convolutional layer. This is going to be uh, 32. So I'm just going to be increasing, like progressively increasing the number of filters in each layer in hopes of like just learning more about whatever came <laughs> through the first layer okay um, that's just kind of how I thought to do it but you can do it however you want uh, one by one stride right did I spell something wrong that looks right Okay, maybe I maybe I spelled something wrong. I don't know. Um, padding equals same. That looks good. Okay, so now let's do. Let's just copy and paste more. So I use four convolutional layers. Um, the number of convolutions. Obviously, the more convolutional layers, the more opportunity you have to learn new features about your data. Um, and I just progressively increase these. So typically you you make the number of filters um, just equal to powers of two. So that's kind of, in case you're wondering like why I picked these, the idea is that I want to get more specific as my data starts to get convolved down through each layer. And I think I kept, yeah, I kept everything pretty much the same. I just changed the filter size occasionally. And now, now that we've done all these convolutional layers, we can do uh, max pooling. So at this point, we just want to do uh, a max pool 2D, and it's going to be a two by two, two by two kernel for our max pooling. Just to try to, because at this point, we, we're done doing convolution. Um, and I think, I did put dropout in here. You don't really, I mean, you might want to consider using it somewhere else or like more frequently in between the layers, but I just like at the very minimum, you might want to put a dropout right before you start flattening or right after you flatten. So the output of this max pooling 2D needs to get flattened down. So let's do that. And now we can just, now we're flattened into one dimension, we can add the, the dense layers. So we'll do model.add dense, or you know, these are also your fully connected layers. And so I'm going to use 128, and activation is going to be ReLU again. Um, let's see, I copy and paste this. And so you really just want to gradually pull down the the dense layers coming out of here the flatten and eventually make it down to your 10 class activation and so because we're doing categorical cross entropy um, the activation function is going to be softmax and it's always good to at least in Keras uh, print out a model summary before just to make sure you can check what your model looks like and uh, we can compile our model. So again, our loss in order to get uh, for classification, because we're doing classification, um, we're gonna use categorical cross entropy. That looks good. Uh, an optimizer 
is going to be Atom. Atom is usually the go-to optimizer because it allows you to get away with not using like momentum and or at least not specifying momentum. So your metrics is going to be equal to what am I doing? Um, accuracy. So sometimes you want loss. Uh, in this case, I think accuracy is pretty relevant. So we'll just set it to accuracy. And hopefully, I don't have any errors, but I probably will. All right, guys. So there's one error. Make sure that you, re you return the model. So this is this is something I forgot. So just do return model, uh, but that should work. Um, so because when I run this model, sometimes it like it bugs out when I run it on the IPython console. So I'm gonna run it in uh, PowerShell. So let's see. All right. So if you're running, let's close that. Uh, so we're watching TQ DM run. This is giving you that nice progress bar, um, and it, it's trying to build. So I guess we'll take this time to talk about like the way I did this is I I put all the data and I just threw it into our memory. So it's all being held in the RAM, uh, which is nice because when our model goes to build on this data. Uh, what ends up happening is it already has the data. It can just call it from memory and it's good to go. It doesn't have to like your GPU doesn't have to handle any of the memory constraints. Now uh, it is possible to use fit generator. And if you use fit generator, then all the memory, you can have the memory be loaded uh, by the CPU. I mean, by the GPU. So the GPU can just build all your memory, but every single time you have to do a new epoch, it's gonna have to reload all that memory again. So there's a little bit of cost with that, but generally, uh, especially when your data size is too big to hold in the RAM on your computer, you have to have your GPU actually load up that memory for you. So that's just a quick subset, <laughs> kind of like while we watch this thing train. Um, so, so fit generator is what you would use in Keras when your data size is just way too large, is pretty much all I'm saying. Okay, so let's kind of talk about what just happened. Um, this is the output of our model.summary from Keras. So you get uh, all of our convolutional layers. You can take a look at the shape as they go into. So you can see uh, our shape as the filters started to increase with the convolutions, but we kept our padding same. So it kind of preserved the 13 and the nine. Uh, and eventually though, we pulled down so we reduced that that dimensionality and eventually we just flattened the six by four by 128 into and it is 3072 and i mean it could be you might want to make this dense larger but the problem here is that uh, look at the number of parameters that you have to optimize like this is a big memory cost like you have to be careful and this is why you should always like take a look at the model's parameters once you've built it to make sure that you're not like taking up an insane amount of memory somewhere where it's probably not even like necessary. Uh, but eventually, you know, I put these dense layers, they go down and you get an output of those that 10, uh, I guess a, a one by 10 matrix with a categorical cross entropy. So like half a million parameters, not really a small network, but not necessarily a big network in my opinion. Um, this is all the TensorFlow running GPU. If it looks, if you're running CPU, this will look probably totally different. Um, and then you just see all of our training. Um, even after the first pass of the data set, it learned it got like 65% accuracy, which is really good. And eventually we got up to 95% accuracy. So um, that that's a pretty good result. That's the convolutional neural network. Um, and that that's really impressive in my opinion. Um, the reason it was able to do this is because we built out those MEL frequency septal coefficients. So good pre-processing of our data, you know, calculating the theoretical noise floor, downsampling our audio. These are all things you got to think about. And if you do everything right, then you should get really good performance for your neural network. All right. Uh, so in the next video, we'll talk about the recurrent neural network. And we'll just kind of talk about like the advantages and disadvantages between the two. Um, so yeah, um, I'll see you guys in the next video.